many color gophers are there? Raise your hand, don't say it out loud. How many colors of gopher? I'll owe you something if you get it right. Five. Oh, wait, I have to count. Say the colors. <laughs> Whoa, oh, you say blue. Ah, oh, well, that's one. Turquoise is one. Hmm? Oh, I, I, we didn't designate it that, but that's a really good color name. Purple. How did you know there was a yellow? No one knows that. That's my trick to this entire question. Oh, darn it. Pink. What else? Mm, no. It wasn't approved. Yeah, we tried for a green one. What other? What other colors? There's one. Gray. You. You. I think that's it. Pink, teal, normal blue, gray, and there's like 10 yellow gophers in the entire universe. It's not working? Okay. All right. We'll do things differently. That's okay. How many Go conferences are there this year? You don't count, Florin, because you know too much. You know too much. Someone from the back, how many Go conferences are there this year? More, less. 15, there's 15. How many were there last year? No, I think there were about nine. Yeah, there were nine. So we've grown a lot, which I'll talk about if my clicker works. All right, uh, what other Go trivia can I give to you? What? Hmm? You could I could, but there's also issues with that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this fun? No worries. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so that's my face. So we're going to start over so that they can cut all of that out of the video. Uh, so this is my face. I'm eating a donut. I know, just pretend it's funny again. This is the second time we're doing this for those of you on video. Uh, the only uh, important thing to really know about me is that I joined the Go team uh, last year and late last year, and I am running open source strategy for Go at Google. All right, so, all right. So I, I'm gonna be really honest with all of you. I didn't really want to come do this today, and I was struggling with what to talk about. Uh, I, I couldn't figure it out, and I didn't know why it was bothering me so much. So I, I sat and I thought about it two days ago, as I decided to change my talk two days ago, which is the other reason why I fell asleep late last night. Uh, and, and I realize it's because Go is changing so very quickly. It's hard to keep up with, and it's especially hard for me coming out of the community and going to the Go team. The transition has been phenomenal and amazing, but also I'm seeing multiple sides of what the Go project is going through. So we've grown to maybe a million and a half gophers worldwide, depending on the numbers, depending what you look at. Russ Cox has a wonderful blog post that details exactly how he gets these numbers. Um, so if you're interested, just go to his blog. Uh, and, and a few years ago, when I fell in love with the Go community, it was a fraction of what it is now. We were just talking about you know, the fact that we went from nine conferences to 15 this year. That's looking like that will be close to almost 20 next year. Uh, and we've scaled in a way that no one could have predicted. So if you all have seen any presentations lately, if you've seen anything from Steve Francia, uh, and you've read any of these surveys, you'll, there's a trend that Go is firmly the next language that developers want to learn. This is a huge feat, and we should be really proud of this. Go is talked about as the language of the cloud, which is awesome. Projects like Kubernetes, Docker, it's major. 
Aditya yesterday mentioned how Go is the language that the internet runs on. Phenomenal. But it's also not surprising because Go is an awesome language and it has a very excited, engaged user base. Still, over the last couple of months, most of us know that we've been facing some challenges. Uh, our community has had some problems, and they've primarily been online. Let me be clear that I don't feel that these problems are specific to Go. I don't feel that they're specific to the Go community. But I do feel that it's our duty as open source contributors, because yesterday we established we're all contributing to the project simply by being here and participating. I do feel that it's our duty that we communicate what type of community we want to be moving forward as we grow. So here's a tenant of Go. Go's features should interact in predictable and consistent ways. That's beautiful. Like, take it in. It should interact in consistent, predictable ways. But I had a big problem with this when I read it. My problem was that we, as humans, do not function in that way. We are really messy creatures. I mean, some of us are neater than others. I'm definitely more on the messier side. You can just look at my desk at work and kind of get that sense. And yet, this, this quote is very true. Community is at the core of what you're choosing, especially when you're choosing an open source project to work with. Community will have the greatest impact, someone, some would say, on the language of your choice. So before we dig into some of the deep, there are a lot of people that love Go for so many reasons that go beyond just the language. Brian here touches on a theme that I see when I ask for these tweets on what do you love about Go and its community of energy and leadership enablement, the ability to become a leader easily, and the availability of mentors that you can find in the Go community. Logan describes something that holds very true to me and why I fell in love with the Go community, which is a sense of openness and continuous learning, this education that's behind everything that we do and that we see in Gophers all over the world. And Carlton touches on something that I know not everyone agrees with, but I think is a really beautiful thing and that I see in our community leaders especially, which is a sense of humbleness and inclusiveness, a theme that is in the language itself, and it thrives throughout our community. That said, we're all very different. Even uh, GopherCon India and GopherCon Iceland to GopherCon UK has very different locales. They have very different energies. And our experiences within this community can differ. Some people find it super rad, super awesome. I know I sound like a super millennial right now. But, you know, I'm sure we've seen some actions that make us scratch our heads or our beards, depending on what you have going on. So this is a very well-known quote by Rob Pipe and, and Pike. And Go is doing what it is set out to do. It is making programmers' lives better and more productive. This we see. It wouldn't have the massive growth if it didn't, if it wasn't doing that. But in the end, Go is just a language. It's just an open source project that's built for consumption. People are the ones, you and I are the ones, that dictate how it's perceived and what true impact it will have. <coughs> so this talk comes down to, I'm a little bit worried. And that's why I struggled with what to, what to talk about today. Uh, I didn't want to 
come on stage and just talk about how awesome Go is and how much we're growing, because I've done that at a few conferences, and it's been rad and super exciting. But we're also dealing with this problem of massive scale. What happens? What are we going to become? What happens if we aren't intentional with the community that we want to be? What happens if we're not opinionated about the behavior that is acceptable and not acceptable to us? Where will we be in a few years? So, if you haven't seen me talk before, this talk is not normal for me. Uh, and best believe, it's uncomfortable for a lot of reasons to get on stage and not be as like peppy and enthusiastic as I usually am known to be. But I, I couldn't come here and just report how great Go is doing. I, wanted, I want you all to understand the impact that you have as individuals in the community. As you think about what contributing means in terms of functionality and the act of doing it, I want you to consider your actions. I want you to consider how your contributions and the way that you contribute, how you communicate, affects the developers that you're interacting with. So we're gonna do a mental exercise. Uh, it's not super intense, don't worry. I know, that was really scary. That's a scary sentence. Uh, but I just want you to answer a few questions in your mind as we run through them. And I want you to internalize them. Then I'm gonna take you through another exercise of just being human. Uh, because being human is okay. Uh, but we have to be aware of how we interact with each other. So, what do we want? Who do we want to be? What kind of community do we want to have? Do we want to be proactive or reactive? Do we proactively look what will be necessary long term to our language and to our community? Or do we reactively take action based on the drama that's happening on Twitter that day? Are we inclusive or exclusive? Are we a community that includes all types of people with all kinds of opinions, even those that differ from our own? Do we take said opinions and think about where they come from, what their experiences are, what they're pulling from? Do we pause and accept someone who's coming from another language, a different community that could bring something back to ours? Do we accept those differences or do we simply dismiss them? Are we approachable or elitist? This I have seen change over the last few years. Last four, three years, I've seen a real change in how this is thought about in our community. Are we a community anyone could join, any developer of all skill levels, or are we one that only the top 10, 5, or 1% can join? Are we meant to make most developers productive? or just some? And if the answer is we're meant to make most developers productive, have we provided the, the materials and the tooling that they need to do so? So I, in, in my thoughts, this could be boiled down to, are we nurturing or neglectful? Are we a community that fosters innovation? that accepts differences and attempts to become better based upon those differences? Or do we neglect and ignore anything that seems different from us? Is it okay with sometimes being a contrarian? And can we reconcile that without being combative? And the big one, are we sustainable or are we fleeting? Are we, as Go, as the community, as the language, meant to stick around, or is Go just a fad? So I'm sure that these questions, it's, it's very serious, it's so serious. And they're gonna, they're gonna evoke emotion and 
opinions, and some we're going to be uncomfortable with, and that's okay. Let's assume we want to be proactive, inclusive, approachable, nurturing, and sustainable. What's really behind all of that? I believe it's empathetic collaboration. I think our biggest blocker in this, which I, I thought a lot about, is the internet. More specifically, I believe it's how humans interact on the internet. So let's be real. Some people can get downright mean online. There seems to be often a, a lack of accountability when the written word has become our main mode of communication. People get online and they feel they're anonymous. Nothing can touch them. And the, the normal processing of a social contract seems to disappear. Things people would never say out loud or in person get put out there online. In some ways, this can be liberating. We have seen this. I have felt this. I have been this. But in others, it can be extremely harmful. For me, the ability to maintain compassion and empathy via online communications is one of the most undervalued in interpersonal traits someone can have. It is the most important trait to have in those moments before we tweet, retweet, answer a question on Reddit, or give our opinion on Stack Overflow. So why does this matter to the Go community? Like Aditya mentioned in his talk yesterday, first impressions matter. So how many of you have only been coding in Go for a year or less? Raise it high. So that's about almost 40%, six months or less. OK. So that is our primary user base. We grew about 35 to 40% over the last year. Those people who are newer to the community don't know the history of Go. They don't know the history or drama of the community. They don't understand what the undercurrents are. All they see is how we treat each other, talk to each other online, and they assume that that is the way it should be. They're impacted by how we act. They have no sense of our history. So everyone has bias. I hope we've all been through bias discussions or bias talks. And I want you to just take a moment and be comfortable with your bias. I want you to look at me, all right, if you're not already. And you can, you can very clearly see what I am not, all right? I'm not white, because I'm not super pale. I've got a good tan going on, thanks. I'm not blonde, and not even like naturally. I've got grays, but no blonde in there. I'm not super smiley today, but you can see I'm a little peppy, all right? So you're making judgments about me. That's okay. Make judgments about me. But... You know where I work, you know what I work on, you're getting a sense of what I think about, but do you really know me? Do you really know who I am, what I've been through? Do you know that I struggle deeply with depression? Do you know that I have severe social anxiety in the last few months? That makes this really hard. It seems weird, right, because I'm on stage doing this, but it's actually a little terrifying. And being in a group of 10 intimate people makes me sweat extra bad. That I have PTSD. Would you know any of that just by looking at me? It's okay to judge. It's okay to have bias. That's human nature. We have to make very quick decisions to survive. That's how we've done what we've done as a species. It's a survival instinct. But don't be limited by your instincts.
I hate casserole. I love pie. Like, I really love pie. Popcorn is the best. Seriously. These are things that you, you don't know about me. I'm asking you to check your bias and rise above it. Accept that your bias is a survival instinct, but don't lean into that. I know, I also love The Simpsons. It's revolutionary. So we have bias because we're human, but we want to be, I hope, empathetic and collaborative. How do we do that? Well, okay, we could talk for another hour on how to do this, but I'm just going to break it down into two things so that all that I'm asking that you take away from this talk and all that I'm asking that you give back to our community is two things. You can quite simply just listen like you're doing now. Listen to what someone says. Consider your first immediate reaction is full of bias based on your own experience that can differ dramatically from someone else's. Especially online, internalize your own bias before responding, understanding that your assumptions may not be correct. They may not be true. Personally, I find, and I've been doing this for a very long time, that I delete almost the first of anything that I write responding back to someone, because I am a hothead by nature. Trust me. <laughs> but it's been a problem my whole life. I'm super opinionated, so I usually delete it, because it's not very nice most of the time, and I have to accept that that's who I am. Accept that someone else's perspective will never be your own, and that you do not know everything about them, as we've made clear. And you don't know what's happening in their life right now. You don't know if they have lack of sleep because the kids kept them up, or if they skipped breakfast and they're in a bad mood, or if someone just wrote them a horrible review on Yelp and they just can't get over it. That happened to me when I was in retail. Could not get over it. And then respond after you consider where they might be coming from. In the context of our community and in the context of open source, let's try to be a community that shows gratitude. Are there any open source maintainers in the room? Yeah. So you know that gratitude sometimes comes very rarely. And when you're sifting through issue after issue, which are sometimes just complaints, they're not even suggestions on how to do things right, it's very draining. And you're usually doing this because you love it and you want to share it. So say thank you a little bit more often. And this is a hard one. This is something that I've had to practice and I often fail at, especially you can ask my partner in relationship stuff. That's extra hard. But practice how to thank someone instead of criticizing or disagreeing with them, instead of being defensive. So you can say thank you for sharing your thoughts with me if you don't quite agree. That's like a nice way of saying that. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with me today. I'll think about it. That's probably how a lot of you feel right now. Uh, thank you for changing those docs and making that suggestion. I'll consider it. It's another good one. I'll consider it. But it sounds so much nicer, right, than like, no, you're wrong. Thank you for taking the time and letting me know that was incorrect. I appreciate it. One thing that I've struggled with is I get very defensive and combative uh, when I feel like someone's coming at me hard, right? I'm from the ghetto, so apologies if you didn't get the reference, but they're coming at me hard. So my first instinct is to be like, what? 
You coming at me like that? But you can't do that. This is lovely. <laughs> what matters, let's see if this actually reboots. What matters is not how something is delivered to you. It doesn't matter how something is delivered to you unless they're going to physically assault you, which is usually, I hope, not the case. It doesn't matter how someone comes at you. What makes you who you are is how you approach them back. It's how you respond to them. That's what matters. That is what it means to rise above. So just as an example, I, I am truly grateful for every single one of you. Without you, I, I would really not be here doing what I love, which is not necessarily to give a lecture on empathy, although it's clearly something very passionate to me, but being a part of the Go community, being a part of something educational, being a part of something that I feel is revolutionary, that is beautiful. Everyone is of value to me in this room and of value to the Go Project. You're a part of a community that's been growing for years. You are the people that will shape this community moving forward. So many of you are newer and are just starting to put your mark on the community. You are the people that will decide what our standards for communication are. You'll decide if we utilize empathetic collaboration or not. Not me. Yesterday, Adita talked about the many ways that you can become a contributor. And if you've seen any of my other talks, I speak a lot about that as well. Because I believe that by being here, you're a contributor. By answering a question, you're, com you're a contributor, etc. Thank you to all the meetup organizers and conference organizers in the room, by the way. Because that's a rough job. I hope that what you can take from this talk is that if you hear something that you don't like, that you don't understand, if you see the tweet storm, if your first reaction is to be defensive, that you just pause and you take a moment and you think about how you can be a little bit more empathetic in your responses. Thank you.